Fantastic. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, seismic considerations for embankment design. This is going to be a, a very, very brief introduction to to um, seismic considerations. that just enough to kind of give you guys the basic information you need to go forward in the future. Are we good on the sound there? Yeah, we're just adjusting a couple of things in our speakers. You're good. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. So the objectives of this um, presentation are to explain the basics of seismic behavior of soils and embankments. Provide an overview of seismic analyses, which include liquefaction triggering um, or large strength loss, and then embankment deformation analyses. Um, so I'll also describe some of the material characterization requirements for seismic analyses. And this uh, evaluation and these material properties would be something you develop as part of that material calculation packet or material characterization calculation package you developed um, that Brian talked about yesterday. So that all go in there and would be updated as needed as you go through your seismic analyses. So just some of the basics, uh, seismic waves um, are, there's, there's three different kinds. Um, the, the first one, you have um, an S wave. They move particles back and forth along um, the ground at right angles to the direction that the wave's moving. You can see that in this one right here. Um, a P wave compresses particles along the direction of the wave, so it goes back and forth here. And then a surface wave moves them in a circular pattern at the surface, so you can kind of see here, actually it's going this way. Um, kind of looks like the surface waves in an ocean. A single earthquake event can and often produces all of these waves, so um, it's difficult to predict if your embankment's going to move, um, you know, horizontally uh, along the axis of the dam, horizontally perpendicular to the axis of the dam, you know, it's going to go up and down. There's going to be all kinds of movement going on um, as the earthquake hits your dam. So uh, there's two uh, major behaviors of concern um, for seismic events when you're looking at seismic performance of an embankment. Uh, the first one is the potential for liquefaction or large strength loss, which could lead to instability. Uh, the slope instability would then lead to either overtopping, so you you lose enough of your crest to exceed the freeboard of your dam, available in your dam, um, but it also could cause cracking and uncontrolled seepage. So if you have enough slope instability and movement of your downstream slope, that will cause internal cracking and internal erosion in your dam. Um, the second one is you don't have large strength loss in any of your materials, but the deformations are great enough that it could lead to overtopping, um, again, if your freeboard's small enough that you, you lose enough of your crest to overtop, or again, um, with the cracking, if you have enough movement of your dam. Um, so uh, this is applicable to Arbicore dams, but because Arbicore dams were built for flood control, most of them have very large freeboard, um, and it makes seismic performance less critical. So. Um, we don't have a ton of dams out there that where seismic uh, performance becomes a risk driver for failure of our dams. So I'll just go through a, a few slides to show uh, kind of in a cartoonish form what each of these uh, issues looks like. Uh, so this is a graphical representation of strength loss in soils um, in or underneath the downstream slope of the dam. So you have either um, you have a failure either, or a liquefaction or strength loss either in this area of the foundation or somewhere in the slope of the dam. This large loss in strength leads to instability of the downstream slope and then the crest drops. Uh, this crest reduction um, is enough to exceed the available freeboard and overtopping ensues. And then you just follow kind of an overtopping event tree to determine if you're going to fail the dam. Okay. Uh, next is liquefaction or large strength loss leads to cracking or uncontrolled seepage. Uh, in this case, uh, strength loss also occurs in the soils in or underneath the downstream slopes. So you're looking in the same area here, and that leads again to instability of the embankment. Um, however, you don't exceed your freeboard in this case. Um, it's not as the instability is not that great. Um, but you do create large cracks in your dam due to the instability and the movement of the slope. 
and these cracks lead to internal erosion. And then at that point, you'd um, evaluate whether or not internal erosion would occur. Okay. So then uh, looking at accumulated deformations, so large strength loss doesn't occur anywhere under or in your dam, but because of the high seismic events, um, it exceeds the um, it causes a deformation to occur. The dam moves around enough, settles enough. You can have quite a bit of settlement, um, even if you don't have large strength loss or liquefaction. And that's enough to reduce the crest enough to allow overtopping to occur. And then again, in this case, you follow through an event tree of overtopping to determine if overtopping is going to fail the dam. The final one looks the same as overtopping, except you don't actually overtop. Um, you have a potential for internal erosion, a concentrated leak erosion most likely through any cracks created in the dam. So you have that as your initiating event, and then you determine if um, internal erosion would continue and progress to failure at that point. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about liquefaction um, or other large strength loss in soils, because this is the first thing you need to evaluate when you're doing a seismic analysis, um, liquefaction occurs most commonly in low density sands or gravels and low density, low plasticity silt. Um, so it's, it's a low plasticity material. Um, rock fill shells with enough sand or silt uh, to control the soil behavior may also be potentially liquefiable. Um, this is an issue that the industry has actually recently recognized and is starting to work on and figuring out how to evaluate. Uh, it's still kind of a new issue that we're recognizing. So there's not a lot of information available on how to, one, uh, characterize the material in this case, and two, um, perform evaluations uh, for this case. So it's something that if you encounter this, uh, you, you're gonna take probably quite a bit of research. Um, there's actually numerous rock fill dams in our, our that we're currently looking at um, to determine if they are potentially liquefiable in the event of a large uh, seismic event. And it's, it's, a, it's a rough process trying to find the right information. Um, so liquefaction doesn't generally occur in fine-grained plastic soils, but these soils do have the potential um, for large strength loss. You have to look at that. Um, large strength loss can occur in normally or lightly overconsolidated sensitive clays um, or plastic soaps. So you want to take a look at the sensitivity of those clays. Basically, um, if they're loaded, uh, how much strength might they lose? And you can do that through lab testing. You can look at residual strengths versus peak strengths to see how sensitive they might be. Um, and in some cases, we found that even compacted clay cores um, can be subject to strain softening if the seismic event is large enough. Um, so we're, we're finding out more and more about those large subduction zone events, stuff like that. Um, if there's a, a, um, a fault really near your dam, say you're in California, um, there's the potential for large, large um, uh, ground motions to affect your dam, and that could even cause compacted clay cores to lose some strength during the event. So that's something you need to take a look at. Uh, so we'll take a little uh, kind of walk through uh, some examples of stress strain behavior of sands and gravels. So this is what they look like generally when loaded. Um, so here is a normal stress versus shear stress plot. You can see uh, we have two, three soils here. There's a dense soil. You can see the failure path here for that. Um, so this, yeah, and then um, you can see the uh, two loose soils here. Can you see those here? Um, loose soil two, actually, and loose soil loading or contract upon loading. So this dense soil, is going to dilate upon loading, and these loose soils will contract upon loading. So that's what this is showing. Um, and you'll see here when you're looking at the stress strain plot, ah, right here, um, this dense soil is going to actually gain strength as it's loaded. It's not going to lose any strength. Uh, whereas these loose soils here, they'll, they'll initially gain strength, and then they'll drop off past their peak strength, and they'll lose strength. Um, and then down here, you can take a look at the pore pressure plot. So initially, this dense soil 
will um, gain a little bit of pore pressure, but then the pore pressures will uh, drop as the soil dilates upon loading, and then the soil will contract upon loading to loose soils. Those soils will contract upon loading and pore pressures will build up. So these are kind of figures you want to take a look at when you look at your lab test to see if these soils are tend to dilate, which means that they won't build up pore pressures during loading. Um, if they're contractive, they will tend to build up pore pressures during loading, and that's a concern for um, potential liquefaction, potential strength loss issues. So this is, I wanted to point this out because this is something you might see in the lab for a normally consolidated or a lightly over consolidated sensitive clay. So you can see as it's loaded, um, as the strain increases, it does reach an initial peak. Um, you get quite a bit of strength, but then it drops off pretty quickly as the strain on the soil increases. Um, and you'll drop to probably a fully softened and then a residual strength as you continue uh, straining the soil. So this residual strength here is oftentimes much less than the peak strength um, and is what you might encounter uh, during an earthquake loading. So this um, slide here shows uh, unstable versus stable earthquake behavior that you might encounter during loading. Um, a stable soil, uh, a stable soil will uh, gain strength with additional strain as the slope starts to move as to after it's being shaken by the earthquake. Um, that's shown on the bottom figure here. So you can see the initial earthquake shaking um, causes changes in the strength. And then um, once it hits a certain strain and the earthquake stops, it'll, the soil, the slope will start to move a bit, but the strength will increase and that will um, slow down the movement and stop it from becoming unstable. Um, unstable behavior, you'll, you'll have that initial earthquake straight, initial earthquake um, cycling. And then you'll have some strain here that will start to move the slope. And then at some point as the slope moves, you'll lose strength and the slope will continue to move. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so in this slide, uh, we have found that um, in doing, slope, in doing um, deformation analyses, that um, the, the flow slide will continue um, even as forces drop and accelerations go to zero as you get towards the factor of safety of one in your slope. So you might think that, hey, I, my slope's moved some, but I've come to some sort of equilibrium because the driving forces and the resisting forces um, have become equal. Um, so you can see that the driving force here is greater than the resisting force, but at some point they hit they become equal to each other, and that's where they hit a factor of safety of one, and then the resistance continues going and the driving force drops off as your acceleration drops off um, after an earthquake. But um, what we found is that actually, um, because the acceleration has just gone to zero, you still have some movement that's still slowing down. Um, the, 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 the flow slide will actually continue to move after the earthquake ends and after um, the when you think it might have reached equilibrium. So um, that's something you have to continue your models. Uh, if you're doing a deformation model, you have to make sure that you've um, run the analysis long enough to reach an equilibrium of actual flow stopping as opposed to uh, factors of safety reaching one. Um, so uh, we've talked a few minutes, we've spent a few minutes so far talking about how some soils have the potential for strength loss with increasing um, strain and deformation. So, you, you know, they have that peak, they hit that peak, and then they have that large drop off. Um, do you think that, you know, hey, that, that might mean no matter what, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flow, it's going to fail, um, but really you have to have those deformations um, be great enough to exceed uh, the strength of the soil. So right here, if you take a look at this, it's being loaded, but it's not being loaded above its peak strength. It's not being loaded past its uh, maximum shear stress. So in that case, it's not going to actually fail. Um, so uh, the deformation is going to be limited in this case because you haven't exceeded the strength of your soil. Um, uh, in the opposite case, if a soil has 
little or no strength loss potential. So you can kind of see here, it's not going to drop off. Um, however, if you're loading it above that strength, you are going to get some deformations and you're going to increase your deformations um, above that. You're, you're actually going to get some deformation, even though there's little or no strength loss going on because you've exceeded the capacity of the soil. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to analysis methods now. Uh, before that, I wanted to uh, see if there were any questions um, related to the just initial discussion. Awesome. We'll move on now. Now, as I mentioned, um, I'm not going to go into really much detail at all about earthquake analysis methods. Um, there's the earthquake engineering community is still trying to come to a consensus on various methods. They're still trying to evaluate the available data they have. They're still trying to figure out what the best methods available are. Um, and the earthquake engineering industry is constantly changing. Um, I, I personally have had trouble keeping up with them in the last few years because I haven't done a lot of earthquake work because um, the, the core doesn't have a lot of projects where earthquake and seismic issues are a big deal. So uh, um, we recently stood up a, a seismic cadre um, from the risk management center and just getting back up to speed on, on earthquakes has been quite a, quite a bit of work to see what's happened in the last three or four years. Um, so, the, in, in terms of earthquake analyses, the first step you want to go through is evaluating whether or not uh, liquefaction or strength loss um, may occur in any of your soils um, in your embankment or below your embankment. Um, and then, once you figure that out, you can do uh, analysis to determine whether or not that strength loss um, that liquefaction or even just accumulated deformations is going to cause a stability issue um, or a major amount of deformation. And doing that, and there, there's, there's several methods that have been used in the past to analyze that. There's post-earthquake stability analyses. Those are a static method of, of evaluating um, stability, instability. There's pseudostatic stability analyses. Um, those used to be used pretty frequently and are not recommended anymore. They do have their uses in deformation analyses, but I'll go through why those are not really recommended anymore. Um, there's new mark type deformation analyses, those sliding block analyses, and then there's dynamic deformation analyses using a numerical model such as FLAC. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these analyses. So first off, there's um, liquefaction or strength loss potential. I'm not going to talk a lot about strength loss potential because there's not a lot of um, guidance yet on um, that. There, there's some evaluation. You take a, determine whether or not it's a sensitive soil, but there's not a, a detailed triggering method like you would do for liquefaction. So it's more of a looking at the material properties of the soil and whether or not it might lose strength with large amounts of strain. Um, but for liquefaction, there's a number of methods out there to evaluate liquefaction triggering. Um, I've pointed out two right here, Idris and Boulanger, they published a monograph in 2008 from the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. Um, and then Seton et al. recently published, and I say recently, it, it was six years ago now, but that's fairly recent, um, a paper on triggering as well. Um, so in a triggering evaluation, you evaluate the potential liquefaction as a factor of safety against liquefaction for the resistance of the soil or the cyclic stress ratio, uh, cyclic resistance ratio, sorry, CRR, is compared to the stress imposed by the earthquake, and that's um, measured as a cyclic stress ratio. So um, the methods noticed on this slide, uh, the Seton and et al. and Idris and Boulanger um, are, use a database of field data from sites that have experienced an earthquake to develop a cyclic stress ratio based on either SPT, CPT, um, and in some case, uh, shear wave velocity data. Uh, then the stress imposed by the earthquake, that CSR that you have, um, can be developed based on simplified methods uh, noted in these references. So Idris and Boulanger has some guidance on how to develop a CSR based on the PGA of the earthquake, um, or it can be developed 
um, using a numerical model um, such as quad four. That's, that's one of the more commonly used ones. Um, generally, evaluating the potential for liquefaction using only one method is sufficient. If the factor of safety against liquefaction is much greater or much less than one, you're going to get similar results. Um, with all your all these various methods for evaluating liquefaction potential, um, but if the factor safety is right around one, um, you might want to look at both Idris and Boulanger and Seaton et al. Maybe to evaluate um, the potential for liquefaction, just to see how sensitive uh, that is. Uh, and and um, in the past, uh, engineers in the industry um, have mixed and matched various bits and pieces of different uh, liquefaction triggering methods based on data they had available or, um, you know, what was easier or anything like that. But what um, has recent guidance that has come out, the National Science Foundation did an evaluation of the state of liquefaction triggering, and they said, they said, no, don't do that. That's not really representative of what the researchers were trying to do. Do not mix and match parts of each method. Um, apply each method as is defined in the paper or monograph um, provided. There's also probabilistic versions um, for evaluating the potential for liquefaction. Um, they use the same database, but they look at the probability that liquefaction may occur. Um, so there's one example right here from Boulanger and Idris published in 2012, um, and this method uses correlations that Idris and Boulanger developed earlier for triggering and just puts it in a, a probabilistic framework. Um, there's a couple more examples here, Topak et al. 1999 and then Seaton et al. 2004. Um, so any one of these methods, again, um, they're all uh, just different ways of looking at the same data, um, different understandings of the data, different evaluations of the same data. Um, so I would just tend to look for the most recent one um, and see what it looks like and if it's helpful to you. All right, so now that you've evaluated your liquefaction potential, you've taken a look at your finer grain soils, do you have any plastic soils, do they have the potential for strength loss? Um, now, how do you evaluate whether or not that strength loss or liquefaction is going to lead to either slope instability or large enough deformations to cause an issue in your project? So, one method is a post-earthquake stability analysis, um, limit equilibrium analysis. This is just a limit equilibrium analysis like I talked about yesterday. Um, the difference is, is that you find the materials that are liquefiable and assign them a lower strength. So in this case, the uh, design team determined that there is an upper alluvium layer in here that was potentially liquefiable um, and, uh, for this post-earthquake stability analysis. Um, so the factors of safety requirements for post-earthquake stability analyses are, are not well defined. Um, there's no guidance in uh, USAID guidance available for that. Um, some states may have some guidance, but they tend to be sort of wishy-washy, I want to say. There's no clear, this is must what it be, but a lot of times they'll um, recommend a range of 1 to 1.1. 1 .1. So you're, you're just looking to make sure the dam doesn't fail during an earthquake. You might have large deformations, but it's not going to fail. Um, so that's... Uh, in a post-earthquake stability analysis, one thing you need to have is uh, that post-earthquake strength. Um, so it's a reduced strength, potentially, depending upon whether or not the soil liquefies or doesn't liquefy. Um, so there are several correlations you can use to evaluate uh, post-earthquake strength or develop a post-earthquake strength. Um, the first method was developed by Stephen Harder and is based on equivalent clean sand blow counts, or N160CS. Um, so that's what this equivalent clean sand blow count is. Um, and then Idris and Boulanger extended this um, and um, came up with a, a residual shear strength over sigma v c prime relationship, so a ratio um, in this case. And they did, they do still use it. Theirs is called um, N160CSSR. <laughs> so that's defined in their monograph. Um, and they have uh, uh, charts based on either CPT and SPT. 
um, one thing to point out here is that they have two figure they have two lines here, one for no re void redistribution and one for where void redistribution might occur. Um, current guidance says that most cases of liquefaction. of your deposit um, in the worst case scenario. Um, and the general consensus nowadays is that's gonna occur in just about any case. You have liquefaction, so you should be using this lower line. Um, so there's been some updates to this, some new guidance, not new guidance, but other researchers have evaluated this um, and done some more work. Um, I believe uh, um, Ray Seed has updated this um, print published some papers on that. Um, there's also other, uh, Weber et al. has published a, a, a guidance on residual shear strengths. Uh, Jeffries and Bean has some guidance on residual shear strengths. Um, and most of these are uh, either SBT-based correlations or CPT-based correlations. Um, and one thing I actually didn't point out previously in this discussion, but I talk about uh, different methods for or different field data you can use to evaluate liquefaction triggering. Um, it used to be that it was all based on SPT data. Um, as CPT data became more common, so co-penetration tests became more popular and more common out there. Um, researchers have found that CPT data is more uh, reliable uh, for liquefaction triggering analyses. So if you can gather CPT data, that is the preferred data to use for your seismic evaluation. And um, SBT data and uh, shear wave velocity data um, are secondary and can be used but are not preferred. Um, so uh, pseudostatic stability analysis, I know this kind of pops up um, in older guidance. Some states still mention it in their requirements for evaluations for dams. Um, however, so what that is, uh, is a static liquid limit equilibrium analysis with the addition of a whole earthquake motion, so it doesn't account for all those other directions of motion. Um, and then the minimum factor safety allowed for reduced deformation isn't well defined or really well understood. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, you're, there's really not a lot of guidance on a factor of safety for post earthquake or pseudo static analyses. So this method really shouldn't be used on its own to evaluate uh, post-earthquake stability. So um, if you have uh, an analysis where no liquefaction or large strength loss is occurring, you can do what we call a, a simplified deformation analysis, and, and that's a Newmark type uh, sliding block analog. So you can see here, we basically assume the soil is sliding as, as a large wedge, kind of like we do in a limited equilibrium analysis to an extent, um, but this is, doesn't even have those slices involved in this analysis. So um, uh, this is kind of the general form of it. Here's, here's how it would be applied in um, embankment slopes. You can look at it either going upstream or downstream. Um, and this is how those earthquake forces would be applied. Uh, and there's, here's an example of failure wedge you might um, have in a Newmark type analysis. Um, so you, you have, again, it's just a large wedge moving down the slope. So this sliding block model that I just went through real fast um, has been used to develop several simplified deformation analysis methods. Uh, these methods cannot be used, and they, the, the authors of these methods stress this heavily if liquefaction or significant strength loss is expected to occur because it just that's not accounted for in the development of these deformation analysis methods. Um, and an accurate calculation. So you get 1.25 feet of deformation. Yeah, you're probably on the order of one to 10 feet of deformation in that case um, from these methods. So the most well-known method is the McDC and Seed method that was published in 1978. Um, that's a good method for the time. Uh, it's been updated since, and uh, more evaluations have been done. So Brett and Travis Thoreau uh, published a paper in 2007 
with a more current and, and more reasonable method for estimating deformation. They did a ton of, I believe, SLAC models um, and other modeling to come up with this simplified method and with diff all kinds of different analyses, all kinds of different geometries. Um, and then they extended it, Bray and another one of his uh, grad students extended it for use in subduction zone events. Uh, so they published that in 2018. So for a simplified deformation analysis, I'm gonna talk about Bray and Travis Rowe. The input you need is a yield acceleration. So this yield acceleration is about the only time you wanna use a pseudostatic analysis. So with the, what you do is you run a pseudostatic analysis. Um, KY is that uh, inertial force that you apply to the horizontal, um, horizontally to the slice. You uh, iterate and find a KY, a yield acceleration, where your factor of safety is one against sliding. So you, you, you evaluate your uh, limit equilibrium analysis until you get a factor of safety of one, and that's your yield acceleration. Um, then you then you need the fundamental period of the shear surface that you evaluated in that limit equilibrium model, um, and then you need to have a, a range of spectral accelerations because you're going to need the spectral acceleration at one and a half times the fundamental period. So this isn't the PGA, which is a, a spectral acceleration at a, a period of zero, but this is um, this is elsewhere along your um, uh, spectral acceleration curve. Um, and in, the, in their method, they, you can either calculate a, a deformation or you can um, estimate the probability that deformation will be greater than a certain value. So say you have a, a freeboard that has concerns. So you have three feet of freeboard and you want to know if your deformation is going to be greater than approximately three feet. You can calculate that. Alrighty, so all that can be done, those simplified analyses can be used when you're not expecting large amounts of deformation. If you do expect to have large amounts of deformation, you unfortunately have to move to a higher end numerical analysis. Um, SLAC is the most commonly used program, that's a, a finite difference method uh, program. Um, so we're gonna go through just a few examples of SLAC models and kind of what you see in, as a result of a FLAC analysis. So here's a, a cross-section um, that was analyzed as a FLAC model. Um, each zone in this model must uh, be assigned properties in addition to kind of the strength and the unit weight properties you might see in a traditional stability analysis. You need to have shear modulus, uh, damping ratios, um, so you can understand how it's going to behave during a cyclic loading. Okay. So here's a result using material properties that resulted in a stable embankment at the end of the seismic event. So that red mesh there is the initial geometry of the embankment. And then the black mesh shows the deformation at 10 times the expected deformation. So it looks like you're getting a ton of deformation, but this is at a 10 times exaggeration. Um, which is often what you have to do in black models for stable embankments because the deformation is so small you can't see it. Um, so this this shows that the crest in this case will settle quite a bit. Um, you have some issues, but the embankment will maintain its overall geometry. So these are some results you might get out of a flak model. You've got time versus displacement. Um, at either the crest, so this one's got both the crest and the toe, that's two pretty common places to take a look at. You may also um, be interested in looking at, say, halfway down the, down the downstream slope. Um, so in this example, we just have the crest and the toe. So you can see um, <clears throat> the displacement and settles in and the embankment becomes stable at both the crest and at the toe. Um, so you can see the toe, there's quite a bit of vertical displacement but no horizontal displacement in this case. Or sorry, so quite a bit of horizontal displacement, um, upwards of two feet, uh, but no vertical movement, which makes sense because your toe is just gonna slide out and not settle. 
Um, here's a, a finite uh, um, difference analysis. There's a flat analysis for an unstable configuration. So while um, it looks like the cross section does come to some amount of equilibrium, um, what I'll show on the next slide with the deformations at the toe and the crest is that this model basically started moving so quickly and, and moved so much that the model became unstable and they had to stop running the analysis. Um, so flack models can't really continue to show you a flow slide. They don't, they're not built for that and they're not designed for that. Um, so, and then they also, the, the analysts compared this to a factor safety from UTexas and found that it agreed well, the, the UTexas said that the post earthquake analysis was not stable, and that's what the embankment showed, the FLAC analysis showed. So, um, compared this to the previous displacement figures I showed you, um, at the crest, you can get displacement, get displacement, displacement, and it doesn't level off. So at this point, they had to stop the model because the analysis became too unstable. Um, and you can see vertical displacement, it just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. And they don't actually know how much it moves by because they weren't able to analyze that in Slack. And that's the same here with the tow history. It just continues to, to flow out and disappear. Um, let's have on that. So those are the analysis methods you can use to um, evaluate potential for liquefaction and then the deformation potential. At that point, uh, you may know that, hey, your dam's gonna fail because, you know, the slope slid out and it's just not gonna reach an equilibrium. You don't even have to evaluate whether or not overtopping or internal erosion may occur. You just know it's gonna happen because there's no dam left. Um, in other cases, if the deformation is not dramatic enough to uh, fail the dam completely, you will want to take a look at whether or not that deformation is great enough to lose freeboard or great enough to initiate an, an internal erosion, at which point you have to determine if either overtopping will fail the dam or if internal erosion will continue and progress and, and then also fail the dam. Um, so it becomes a part of an event tree at that point. Uh, so design of new dams, say you have a new dam out there um, and you're concerned about the potential for liquefaction. And most times these days, um, it's addressed by removal or treatment of problem materials um, in the entire dam footprint. So just getting rid completely of any potential really liquefiable material. Um, unfortunately, that was not always the case in the past. So I'm gonna I talk about a couple of case histories and um, show you basically what happens when you didn't remove those liquefiable soils or how to treat liquefiable soils in one case. So how many of y'all have heard of the Lower San Fernando Dam slope failure? A really popular one, heard in the 70s. Um, there's a great website uh, called damfailures.org um, developed by uh, ASDSO. They have actually put together a bunch of awesome case histories on dam failures and dam incidents. Um, so that's where this, information on the Lower San Fernando Dam slope failure came from. But basically, uh, the Lower San Fernando Dam was a water supply reservoir in Southern California. Um, it was constructed in the early 1900s using a combination of hydraulic fill deposition and mechanical construction. Um, because it was a water supply dam, water levels were, main, were maintained pretty near the spillway crest until a review in 1966 um, highlighted potential seismic issues. And so they were able to lower, they required, that required them to lower the reservoir level by about nine feet. Um, so they had a decent amount of freeboard going on, fortunately at the time this earthquake occurred, but um, a large earthquake occurred um, in uh, 1971. The seismographs, there were seismographs on the dam because it's a highly seismic area and they had concerns about the um, potential issues at the dam. Uh, so they indicated that uh, the rock PGA uh, was approximately 0.6 G and that a similar ground acceleration was felt by the dam crest. Um, due to the seismic event, uh, a zone upstream on the upstream side of the dam liquefied and the majority of the upstream slope slid into the reservoir. So um, prior to the slope failure, the reservoir had been approximately 35 feet below the crest of the dam. 
Um, but after the failure, only about five feet of freeboard remained. So you can see on the left here, that's what the dam looked like right after failure um, occurred. And so they were really lucky that the, the slope, that the, the reservoir was so low because they had almost no water left or no freeboard left. Um, and then they drained the reservoir as quickly as they could after that, um, of course, because they were worried. There's a large population of people downstream, and they were worried about it continuing to fail. So they, they pulled it down real fast, and you can see basically the entire upstream slope of the dam was just gone. Um, so an investigation of the failure was conducted by a team headed by Harry Steed and Ken Lee. This is probably one of the most analyzed dam failures in history because of the good data they developed during this investigation. Um, but they concluded that a zone of granular hydraulic fill located near the base of the embankment um, and upstream of that clay core, so down here, uh, liquefied. This, li this liquefied zone could no longer support the embankment and the slope failed in large blocks. So they actually went out and identified blocks of material um, post failure and, and reconstructed where they thought the embankment ended up after failure. Um, so as new tools have become available for analysis, uh, this case history has been reevaluated, um, and our understanding of the failures evolved. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, what kind of uh, material properties, what kind of what, what the liquefied strength of the soil was, stuff like that, kind of help us better understand um, what what went on in this project to help us hit, pass that forward to other projects and use the data that use the information we developed on this project to. Um, better our understanding of seismic engineering. Um, so this incident uh, focused effort on seismic evaluation of other dams in the U.S., um, particularly hydraulic fill dams in seismic zones, like this one. Um, hydraulic fill construction was already rare in the 1970s, but then after that, uh, they said, nope, we can't use hydraulic fill anymore in seismic zones, and to be honest, they stopped using it altogether. Um, and they have focused efforts on rehabilitating with, uh, uh, dams with hydraulic fill. So um, there's an existing, here's an um, analysis of an existing dam um, in uh, California. So this is Lake Isabella Dam. It's an Army Corps dam located in Southern California. Um, there's two embankments out there. And uh, during a risk assessment, they became very concerned with some potentially liquefiable materials under the embankment. So um, there was no liquefaction uh, mitigation, uh, mitigation for potentially liquefiable soils when the embankments were built. So um, it, one of the risk-driving failure modes was liquefaction of foundation material leading to embankment deformations great enough to result in overtopping. Um, the liquefaction was risk was based on two potentially liquefiable alluvial deposits uh, primarily silty sand and clayey sand. As you can see there's an upper layer, um, it's about 20 feet thick, um, about 25 feet deep, and then there's a deeper layer that's about uh, 50 feet below ground surface and extends more than 100 feet down to the bedrock. Um, so in evaluations that the design team did, they determined that that uh, deeper layer was less susceptible to liquefaction than the shallow one um, because it's deeper, it's more consolidated. Um, so uh, based on seismic deformation analyses, they felt they could leave that deeper layer in place. Um, however, that upper layer uh, was a major issue, um, and that was, uh, they're doing work right now, but basically what they've done is they've excavated out the downstream slope under the um, auxiliary dam and uh, taken out all that alluvial material, that potentially liquefiable alluvial material, and replaced with a filter and drain blanket. Um, these flat models are for the, uh, auxiliary dam um, because it has the greatest uh, liquefaction potential. But here's a cross-section of the new um, uh, reconstructed portion of the auxiliary dam. So you can see they took out a large portion of soil underneath the downstream slope, um, and then they're raising the dam to, to handle some other risk-driving failure modes and putting in a large buttress and, and drain system in the dam. Um, so you'll get, I think, my understanding is there's going to be an additional case history on this presented later on in this course. If not, I'm sorry, but I do know of good case histories that have been presented on this presentation, on this project. So I'm happy to point you to them. And that's it. Any questions? 
Uh, hold on, Amanda. Let's see. Was that correct, Greg, in that David Serafini is going to talk about this? Yes, you are correct. Or you were going to talk about this? Okay, good. No, he's going to talk about it at the end of today. So. Oh, great. Hi, he's, he's really good presenting. Hi, Amanda. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, um, thank you for the presentation. That was, uh, it's a lot to, <laughs> for sure. Yes. Um, but um, I'm. What would you do if you have um, existing dams? Is there any guidance for what to do when you have earthquakes where they're not supposed to be, <laughs> basically? <laughs> <laughs> when you have earthquakes where they're not supposed to be. Yeah, no. Um, we have dealt with that, too. Um, a, a number of our projects are near um, uh, wells where they're doing hydrofracturing, and that, is, that has caused earthquakes where we didn't expect them to occur. Um, I don't know if there's any specific guidance related to that um, on on how to on how to like recommend evaluations. Um, I, I would suspect that if you have any I mean, large high high hazard dams there, you might want to recommend that they do a at least a basic evaluation of their soils at the site. Um, and see if there's any potentially liquefiable materials, depending upon the the uh, types of earthquakes you saw in that cluster. Um, I, I'd probably recommend chatting with the USGS, seeing if they have any guidance on kind of what kind of earthquakes you might expect to see. Um, and yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and any other any other questions or comments to uh, Amanda? Hey Amanda, this is Brian. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, you mentioned a few other material properties, such as shear modulus, that you need for some of these advanced models. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how those are developed, or if there's any additional lab testing that designers can do if they think that they're going to need that modeling? Yeah, so um, I think you can, you, there's lab testing you can do to evaluate shear modulus. Um, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but a lot of the higher end labs will have testing that you can do to develop a shear modulus. Um, and then damping ratio, I've seen a lot is just from correlations in literature. Um, clays have one damping ratio you use, and um, Sands and gravels have another. <laughs> so, and, and there's also you can get that, that information also from correlations in literature as well. Uh, is that something you typically vary, like do a sensitivity analysis on those, or is it something that pretty much take from literature and put in? No, I think that it's very similar to. Um, so, there's a lot of sensitivity studies you need to do in a uh, flak modeling. Um, first off. Your uh, seismic engineers are probably going to give you uh, anywhere from 10 to a million um, anal uh, various um, earthquake motion, ground motions to work with. Um, depending on which seismic engineer you talk to, you could need anywhere from three to, I think one, one guy recommended a thousand. But, um, <laughs> so it's a lot. Uh, but so you have uh, ground motions that you have to analyze and look at sensitivity studies on. You want to take a look at your strength profiles uh, because you're not going to, again, as I mentioned earlier, you're not going to know 100% what your strengths are. Um, they're shear modulus, and you have to look at how the shear modulus is going to change with increasing strain. Um, so they have shear, what they call shear modulus reduction curves, um, and there's published literature on that, but again, you're going to want to vary that. Damping ratios, you're going to want to vary that um, to an extent. I think those have a little bit less uh, range on them and a little less effect on your results. Um, and another thing you want to look at is the range in potentially liquefiable soils. So you may have a very well-defined layer of, you know, this 
whole layer of alluvium is going to liquefy, and I know that. I'm just going to go with that. But there might also be some question as to how deep your liquefaction may go. Um, so you want to look at varying your liquefiable zone potentially as well. So um, running uh, deformation analyses, um, you're probably going to have many, many analyses before you're done um, to give you a good understanding of the dynamic deformation.